yeah, so all my work, or everything I'm talking about today is going to be joint work uh, with Mark Shuster. So I'll begin uh, by talking about some very classical number theory, the twin prime conjecture. So one way to state it is there's infinitely many natural numbers n, such that n and n plus 2 are both prime. And if you check, if you look at natural numbers and count how many of them are both prime, it certainly seems like uh, it's a lot. There are a lot of twin primes, especially with very small, small numbers where it seems like almost every prime uh, is, a, is a twin prime. Uh, but, uh, and you know, they get decrease sort of slowly over time. After that, it really seems like there's infinite. But we have no idea how to prove this. And uh, despite that fact, one very natural thing to do is to try to formulate even stronger and more general conjectures that imply the twin primes conjecture. Um, so one example of this was done by Dupolina. And he conjectured that for every non-zero, even h, there are infinitely many n, such that n and n plus h are, are prime. This is, of course, false for odd h, because there's only one even prime. Um, and so this result is, is a nice generalization, but it's not very precise. So just saying there's infinitely many primes of a certain form is not very informative because we would like to know like where these primes are, how far in the number line do you have to look to find a certain number of twin primes or a certain number of pairs such that n and n plus h are both primes. And so for this problem, there is also a conjectural answer, a more precise conjecture, which is by Hardy and Littlewood. Uh, and so they conjectured for a non-zero integer h, if you look at the number of n, such that n and n plus h are both prime, this is asymptotic to x over log x squared. So if you divide by x over log x squared, the number of such primes up to x, and it should converge x goes to infinity for an, to an explicit constant ch. Um, so this constant is, is very simple to write down. Uh, but I'm not going to do it in this talk just because it's not particularly important what the exact value of constant is, but we do know it is totally computable. Um, so you should think of this conjecture as a, a manifestation of the idea that the primes behave randomly. So the, the, the prime number theorem said there's x over log x primes up to x. So you can think of that as that each prime has like a one over log x, or each number has a one over log x probability of being prime. And you can think of these being independent. This is like the Kramer random model of primes. And so if n has a one over log x probability of being prime, and n plus h has a one, one over log x probability of being prime, the probability they're both prime is one over log x squared. Uh, and so that's where this x over log x squared uh, asymptotic point. Um, so this conjecture, um, any of these conjectures, there was not very much progress made on it uh, until there was a lot of progress made in a very short span of time. So the, the breakthrough work was by Yu Tan Zhang, who proved there is infinitely many pairs of primes uh, with distance of most 70 million. So he proved that the Polynax conjecture is true for at least one H between two and 70 million. Um, and the first polymath project uh, improved the upper bound to 4,422. And then Maynard came in with new ideas and lowered the upper bound to 600. And there was a polymath project in order to combining the ideas from all three of the prior works. And they got it all the way down to 246. Uh, and that's uh, still, still the best that's currently known. So because we're kind of stuck on proving these conjectures, um, what I want to do is to kind of change the rules of the game. So I want to consider variants of these problems where instead of working with numbers, we work with polynomials over finite fields. So let me begin by briefly reviewing uh, finite fields. So if you have any prime p, 
then the integer z mod p form a field. Uh, but there are also uh, extensions of that field for q any power of p. There's a unique field f q with q, q elements, which is an extension of z mod p. I'm going to fix, basically, uh, for all my results, I'm going to fix a field f q. I'm going to look at polynomials in, in, uh, in one variable, t, with coefficients in f q. And this is a ring. And it turns out to be very closely analogous to the integers. So almost every concept in number theory we can define using the integers, there's an analogous concept we can define using polynomials over a finite field. Uh, and almost every like conjecture or theorem over the integers, there's a corresponding conjecture or theorem for polynomials over a finite field. And the main difference is some of the things that are conjectured for integers are theorems for polynomials over a finite field. So I mean, one simple variant of integers is, is the, the positive integers are natural numbers. And a natural analog of that for polynomials is the polynomials whose leading coefficient is 1, which are, all, um, which are also known as monic polynomials. So I'm going to denote this as a plus, and I'll be working with monic polynomials for most of the talk. Um, and then in particular, we can define prime polynomials. These are monic polynomials other than 1 which have no monic polynomial factors except one in themselves. So I just took the definition of primes and I just replaced positive integers everywhere in the definition of monic polynomials. Um, so this, this kind of, this replacement is often relatively kind of straightforward. It's like almost a mechanical process. And you can see that you, you replace the definitions and the same kind of properties. So um, an example of the kind of properties that we'll look for for polynomials or a finite field is the prime number theorem for polynomials, which is going to tell us the number of monic polynomials of degree d that are prime is asymptotic to q to the d over d. So we divide it by q to the d over d, and it converges uh, as d goes to infinity to 1. So this is like an analog of the prime number theorem. The total number of monic polynomials of, of degree d is like q to the d. So q to the d is playing the role of x here, and d is playing the role of log x. It's because there's d possible varying coefficients and q choices for each coefficient. Um, so uh, let's just, you know, to get our bearings, let's make things concrete. Let's consider an example. Um, let's work in the smallest finite field f2 and look at polynomials of degree 2. So there's 2 squared for monic polynomials of degree 2. We have just two choices for each coefficient t squared, t squared plus 1, t squared plus t, and t squared plus t plus 1. And the first three of these, we can factor them, and they're not prime. So for t squared and t squared plus t, the factorizations are relatively clear. For t squared plus 1, we use the fact that 2 equals 0 in this field to factor it. And that makes t squared plus 1 equal t squared plus 2t plus 1, which is t plus 1 squared. And so the third one is prime. There's one remaining one. And so this is like the general method for how to count primes of degree d is you can multiply all your lower degree polynomials and whatever remains uh, is prime. And so you can generalize this kind of analysis to other finite fields. If you look at fq joint t, there's q squared polynomials of degree 2. So q of them are perfect squares because there's q linear polynomials to take a perfect square of. There's q choose 2 products of two distinct linear polynomials, again, there's two linears to choose. And so the number of remaining polynomials, we can just subtract and we get q times q minus 1 over 2, which is, which is approximately q squared over 2. So this is an example of the prime number theorem. And you can prove the general case either by this kind of reasoning, counting, inclusion, exclusion kind of thing, or uh, you can use, uh, in a sneaky way, the uniqueness of higher degree finite fields, because the roots of these irreducible polynomials generate the higher degree finite field. And you can use that to count them. So we have the analog of the twin prime, or the, sorry, the prime number theorem. And that lets us state the correct analog of the Hardy Littlewood conjunction. So we're now going to count the monic polynomials of degree d, where f is prime. And in addition, f plus h is prime for a fixed non zero h. And then because we think the probability one polynomial is prime is 1 over d, 
the probability two polynomials are prime is one over d squared. So we have the asymptotic is cubed to the d over d squared, and we divide by that, and we predict that it converges to some explicit constant ch, uh, which again I won't tell you, although if you really want to know, I can tell you. Uh, but here we now have a theorem. So the theorem is that this conjecture is true under some assumptions on Q. So given the on Q, it works for any value of H. And so the assumption we need is Q to be odd. So we, we can't work with powers of two. And we need Q to be greater than 685,090 times P squared. Um, so uh, let, me, let me say something about this restriction, the way you should think about it. So Q is always a power of P. So if Q is P, then this condition is never satisfied. If Q is P squared, this condition is never satisfied. Uh, but if Q is any higher power P, this is satisfied with only finite remaining exceptions. So there are a lot of finite fields which satisfy this, um, but this is entirely a technical restriction. I don't think it reflects anything about how the primes actually behave for these smaller values of Q. Okay, does anyone have questions about this statement? We have some questions in the chat room, but your co-author is handling them very well. Yeah, let, let me know if anything should be. Cool. Uh, so uh, let, me, let me mention, uh, as is appropriate, the prior work on, on this question. So if, you're, if you only care about the existence of infinitely many primes, and you don't want the precise asymptotic, and you, then, then it was previously known also with the restriction that H is a monomial, it's only a single term. Um, and this is done for Q greater than 105 in a paper by uh, Castillo, Hall, Lemke, Oliver, Pollock, and Thompson. And this was based on applying the ideas of Maynard to polynomials over a finite field. And there's a, a very key trick which is used to get this particular result in the paper, which they credited to be to Enten. So I wanted to mention him as well. Um, and then even earlier for agent constant, it was, it, was, it was done by Hall, infinitely many, by some kind of explicit construction. Um, and then the other way you could switch up the problem, which makes it a little bit further from the original problem of the integers, is to fix the degree d and let Q go to infinity uh, instead of fixing Q and letting D go to infinity. Um, and this case was handled by Bender and Pollock as long as Q is odd and by Carmon as long as Q is even. Um, and these, these results all use fairly different methods, I guess from both, both from our work and from, and from each other. So uh, let's talk about another classical problem in number theory, uh, which is Landau's problem to show there are infinitely many primes of the form n squared plus one. Uh, again, this is a very hard problem. And again, we can generalize it to more general polynomials. And so the generalization is one constant conjecture, which gives a nice set of conditions on a polynomial G that ensures that G of n takes a prime value infinitely many options. You have to write down, there are some reasons you can check a polynomial wouldn't take a prime value infinitely many times. And as soon as you avoid those list of reasons, the conjecture is that it does take infinitely many prime values. And again, we can make a more precise conjecture which counts the prime values in a given interval. And so here the more precise conjecture was made by Bateman and Horn. Um, and this, this works for any non-constant polynomial. We look at the numbers, natural numbers n less than x, where g of n is prime, and we conjecture that's asymptotic to x over log x up to some explicit constant cg, um, which you know, maybe zero if, if g fails when you pass these conditions. Um, and this problem is very hard. So if you just look at the case where degree G is one, you can think a little bit and you can unravel, you can see it's the same thing as Dirichlet's theorem on primes and arithmetic functions. But 
as soon as the degree of g is greater than one, there's not any case of this which is no. Uh, the closest thing we have is there are some results on multivariable polynomials. So you have more variables, you have more choice, it's easy to, easier to, to find the primes. Um, and perhaps the most important one is the result of Freelander and Ivanian, which is instead of m squared plus one, look at m squared plus m to the fourth. And they show this polynomial takes infinitely many prime values. Um, and this is a very cool result because the number of natural numbers, which are representative of the form n squared plus m to the four is very small. It's like the number of numbers, such numbers up to x is like x to the three quarters. So they're much rarer than like numbers in arithmetic progressions or numbers in other sets where we know how to count the points. And so again, we can make an analog of this for polynomials over finite fields. So what we want to do is we have a polynomial in our variable x with coefficients in FQT. And so you can think of that if you want as a two variable polynomial in T and X. Um, and we're going to count the number of monic F of degree D such that we plug in F for the X variable into G and we get a prime polynomial in T. And we'll make the same conjecture. We'll conjecture its asymptotic to Q to the D over D times an explicit constant. But there's one difference. There's one thing that is very special phenomena of, of, about polynomials over finite fields that we don't see in integers. And this has to do with we need to assume, it's actually crucial to assume here, that G is not a polynomial in X to the P. So look at the exponents of X appearing in G. One of them had better not be a multiple of P. Um, and I'll talk about why we need that assumption later. When it, when it kind of comes up. And again, we have a result in a special case. So we're going to, we can restrict only to, to quadratic polynomials. Uh, and for simplicity, we're going to restrict the polynomials of the special form x squared plus d for d and fq joint d. Uh, and then the conjecture is true as long as p is odd and q is greater than 2 to the 10 times 3 squared times e squared times p to the 4. Uh, so you did not miss a variable e, I mean 2.718 here. Uh, and um, so again, this is something that's true for infinitely many finite fields, but maybe not all the ones we want to consider yet. And again, this is a technical restriction that I don't think re reflects the actual behavior of prime polynomials. Um, and I'll also pause to consider this result and ask questions, although maybe Mark wants to answer all the questions. Um, and, then, and let me mention uh, prior work. And so there's, there's sort of some recurring themes. So again, if you're only interested in that there's infinitely many uh, prime values and not the asymptotic, then for certain values of G, like maybe a power of x minus a constant, uh, there are uh, results of Pollock, which involve using some kind of clever construction where you take f to be the large power of t. So the number you get is like much less than the expected asymptotic. And again, if you fix the degree d and let q go to infinity, uh, there are some results. There are results by Pollock and, and Entin in some special cases. Uh, and then Kowalski looked at some higher, higher genus analogs of this. Um, so now I want to say something about how you will try to prove these results, both in the integer setting and in the polynomial setting, and uh, we'll also lead into the, the third result I want to talk about. And so this has to do with the parity problem. And the basic summary this is like one of the most important kind of obstructions or ideas in analytic number theory. And the basic idea is if you want to tell if a number is prime, you just have to tell it has an odd number of prime values because primes all have an odd number of prime values. Um, and so the way to test whether a number has an odd number of prime factors that's particularly nice for what we're going to be doing is, is the Mobius function. So the Mobius function is minus one raised to the power of the number of prime factors. So one if it's even, minus one if it's odd, as long as the number of prime, as long as all the prime factors are distinct. 
you have no repeated prime factors. But as soon as you have a repeated prime factor, you just like the Mobius function just splits the difference and it ends up being zero. Um, and so to, to kind of, what does the parity problem mean in practice? It means that to prove a result counting primes before n squared plus one with n up to x, you better be able to estimate the sum of Mobius of n squared plus one with n up to x. You better estimate how many numbers up to x have even numbers versus odd numbers of primes. And to count twin primes, n up to x, we better know Mobius of n times Mobius of n plus two, uh, which is the same thing as Mobius of n times n plus two. Um, and so these sums are like an instruction to proving these theorems in the integer case, and they're also an instruction in, in a polymer or finite field case. Um, but I was a little bit glib with my summary because the justification that prime numbers have an odd number of prime factors, well, they also have a number of prime factors which is congruent only to one mod three, and it's congruent to one mod seven, so they only have one prime factor. But there's actually a reason that we specifically care about an odd versus even number of prime factors that we don't care nearly as much about a mod three number of prime factors and mod seven number of prime factors. Um, and the reason is there are these lovely identities which relate the Mobius function to a function counting primes. So if you sum the Mobius of D times log D over all divisors D of N, and you take a minus sign in front, you get the von Mangle function of N, which is a function which basically counts primes. So it's a function which is zero if n is not a prime power. And if n is a power of a prime p, it's log p. And so this, this function is closely related to the function which is one if n is prime and zero if not. It's a little bit different because you have the log factor and you have the, the, prime, the prime power terms. But in almost any practical problem, it's not very hard to get rid of the prime power terms and, and get rid of the log factor. And so being able to sum the von Mangle function in a given set is as good as being able to count primes in a given set. And so anytime you're summing the von Mangle function, you can use this identity and you can get a Mobius sum. And then the first case of that where D is equal to N is like the case uh, I wrote down above, where we, where we just take our prime sum and turn it into a sum. So that's why the parity problem really works. And so we want to know what happens with Mobius sums. How do they behave? And so the good news is that we expect all of these Mobius sums to cancel. As soon as you have a non-constant polynomial G uh, in, in N, if we sum N less than X to Mobius of G, this sum should be a lot smaller than X. So in particular, if we divide by X, it should go to zero as X goes to infinity. But the bad news is we don't know how to prove this conjecture. Uh, except if degree G is one, it's a, it's a variant of Dirichlet's theorem of primes in arithmetic progressions. Um, and then for higher degree, there are some very strong partial results, which are mainly in the cases where G splits as a product of linear factors. Like G is like product I from K of N plus H R. Um, and so this, we know if k is 2 or k is odd. Uh, and it also requires some additional averaging over x. So you don't just take one value of x and, and take the, divide this. We would take like, you know, 1, 2, 4, 8 up to the powers of 2, and then average over again over the different powers of 2. And then you would know it converges to 0. Uh, and so this is, is the result of a series of papers. It was a breakthrough work of Madomaki, Rajivu, and then they worked together with Tao, and then Tao did a paper alone, and then Tao worked with Turvainen, and the combination of all that work uh, is, is these results. And then for any product of linear factors, no matter the degree, there was, there was a recent result of Turvainen. We may not know what the limit is, but at least we know the limb soup is not, uh, is not exactly one. Or it's not exactly the maximum possible value. I guess you can see that was with the Lugo function, not with this function. So there is a little bit of cancellation there. But these are these results are far from what we need to actually start proving the twin primes conjecture and, and these other conjectures. So 
But this conjecture also, we can make an analog of this over finite fields. So we, we have to begin by defining the Mobius function in this setting. And we'll define it to minus one raised to the number of prime factors if the prime factors are distinct and zero otherwise. And then we can make the analogous conjecture of Kala or the analog to the conjecture of Kala. So uh, if G is a polynomial in X with coefficients and polynomials in T, and we'll plug in F monic of degree D and we'll sum over F monic of degree D, the Mobius of G of T of F. That should cancel. When we divide it by Q to D, it should converge to zero as D goes to infinity. And again, we need to put this strange additional restriction that G is not a polynomial in X to the P. Um, maybe one way of saying the restriction that makes it more similar to the integer case is you could say the derivative with respect to X is non-vanishing. So the derivative of X to the P with respect to X is zero in characteristic P. And so then it would be the same assumption that you make uh, in the integer case. So Non-constant there is equivalent to the derivative of the But it's, it's a little bit strange. It's like, why do we need to consider the derivative? So, but I will explain. Oh, please excuse me. There is a question for you from Asvin. Asvin, will, will you please unmute and ask away? Hi, I'm not sure if I'm audible. Yes, please go ahead. We hear you. Um, yeah, does Chola, Chola imply Bateman Horn or the twin frame conjecture? Or, um... No, so it doesn't. We will use a form of Chola's conjecture to prove Bateman Horn and the twin frame conjecture. But we will use a very strong form of it, which is stronger than what I have stated, but luckily is, is, is equal to what we proved. And we will need other ideas in addition. So there's not a simple implication, but it's sort of like the first step. All you could also think of it sort of as the last step. Um, Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll say shortly what's going on in the case when it is a power, a polynomial next to the And so again, this is something that we can prove in a special case. Uh, and here our formula, our weird inequality on Q looks a little bit more reasonable here. So if Q is a power of prime P, we again need to assume that P is odd. And we need to assume Q is greater than four times K squared times P squared times E squared, where K is the degree of X in G and E is again 2.718. So we need, as the degree in G, of G in X grows, we need high, larger and larger finite fields to improve the statement. But the, the, the growth is pre, it's pretty mild. Like if we go from extensions of a given FP, like FP, FP squared, FP cubed, FP the fourth, FP the fifth, the size of the K we can handle is increasing like exponentially as we extend our finite fields. So a couple of Weeks ago, a couple of months ago, it all seems the same now. I heard you speak about the quadratic case, and at that time you were very pessimistic about higher degrees. Uh, we spoke about the quadratic case of the primes result. Um, so I, at that time, at the time we proved the higher degree case of Mobius, but we didn't do the higher degree case of primes. Ah, so this is still the state of the art. Yeah, this is the okay. same. Yeah, this is the same thing, thing I was talking about last time. I maybe I, did I not may, I maybe didn't emphasize the higher child there because I wanted to talk about the I, I was talking there about the sort of the hard analytic number theory part of the argument as was appropriate for this seminar. And that seminar and for this seminar, I'm gonna take a broader overview as is appropriate for, for this seminar. Um, but yeah, so this is the same same work, the same state of the arts. For Mobius, we can do arbitrarily high degree polynomials as long as the finite field is large. For counting primes, we're restricted to polynomials of degree two. And for twin primes, we're restricted to only two primes instead of higher two primes. Um, and this is because the, of our strategy of reducing from primes to Mobius, it, it, it starts working quite, it, it doesn't work so well when the degree gets larger. It, you, because you, you're, you're factoring, you're dividing into two different factors. And if you have two factors that are very, very large, you don't know what to do. So 
So, okay, I'm going to talk about prior work, and I'll talk about the prior work, which is the most relevant to understanding what we did, uh, which is the work of Conrad, Conrad, and Gross. And this work is devoted to answering the question, like, why are there these restrictions that G should not only depend on X and the K? What happens if G is a polynomial in X and the K? Um, and so Conrad, Conrad, and Gross showed in this setting that Mobius is a periodic function of x. So if what I mean by a periodic function of an integer is that the functions that only depend on the integer modulus and modulus n, the congruence class. Mm -hmm. And so what I mean by a periodic function of a polynomial is it should depend only on the, the congruence class of f mod some fixed polynomial, uh, but I also let it depend on the congruence class of degree f mod 4 uh, for technical reasons. So when you sum Mobius of GTF in this case, you're summing a periodic function. And sums of periodic functions have a kind of straightforward behavior. If you're summing it over a very long interval, you're summing over each congruence class approximately the same number of times. So if the sum over congruence classes vanish, then your sum will cancel very beautifully. And if your sum over congruence class does not vanish, your sum will not cancel. So Conrad, Conrad, and Gross like evaluated the sum and they showed sometimes it cancels and sometimes it doesn't. So both behaviors really occur. So unlike Chawla, it's kind of a conjecture of the random behavior of Mobius, but Mobius is really behaving in a non-random way in the special case. And that makes Chawla sometimes fail. So one way to think about theorem three is that it is handling the remaining case that was not handled by Conrad, Conrad, and Gross, and everything would they, would they handled, we show a childhood conjecture remains true. But this kind of understates the relationship between what we're doing and what they did, because we're kind of doing a reduction to the case they studied. The strategy we're going to use is to like substitute F equals R plus S to the P, where R and S are two new variables, and show cancellation in S. And when we get cancellation in S, we're going to be summing by their result, or we prove a slight variant of it. They'll be summing a periodic function. We'll not be getting summing a periodic function over a very, very long interval. So we can't use these most classical techniques for proving cancellation in some of the periodic functions. But it still turns out that it is much possible to show cancellation with periodic function sums using methods that wouldn't work for our original sum. And so again, there are uh, um, prior results for this problem. And I think only in the Q to infinity uh, version. Uh, so for fixed number degree, and it was done by Carmon and Rundick, if G is a product of linear terms. And then there was actually a very close relationship in the Q to infinity setting between the Mobius and the uh, uh, bateman horan results. And so it, Pollock, Enten, and Kowalski solved this problem in like exactly the same cases as they solved the Bateman Horn problem in the Q to infinity round. Um, so in the remaining time, I'm going to try to say something about the, the proof of this theorem. So the proof has kind of three different steps, which I'm going to be explaining, I guess, sort of in reverse order. But the first one I'm going to explain is going to use the most kind of classical methods from analytic number theory. It's all about manipulating sums and then estimating different terms in your sums. The second will use like elementary algebraic manipulations of polynomials. Uh, and the last one will use kind of non-elementary algebraic geometry. Uh, methods. So I hope everyone will find at least one of these approaches uh, interesting, although maybe that's too much to ask if there's a lot of people here, but hopefully many of you will find some of them interesting. So the strategy we're going to use is always going to be what I mentioned. We're going to take our prime counting results, just immediately replace them. So the strategy for proving theorem one and theorem two, so our results about the primes, using our results about the Mobius. And so we're going to do exactly what I sort of foreshadowed earlier. We're going to take counting 
our prime counting, we're going to turn them into sums of the von Mangel function, which here we'll define to be zero for if a polynomial is not a prime power and the degree of pi, if it's a power of a prime pi. And we're going to use this identity, which relates the von Mangel function to the sum of the Mobius function of the divisors of the polynomial to turn our von Mangel sums into more complicated Mobius sums. Uh, and I'm going to explain this process in theorem two in the result about prime values of quadratic polynomials in F because it, this step of the argument is a little bit uh, simpler in, in that case, although other steps can get more complicated. So what we're going to get when we get that, we're going to sum over degree F equal to D, monic. We're going to sum von Mangel function of F squared plus D. And we're just going to immediately rewrite that as a sum over G dividing F squared plus D, monic, of Mobius of G. And we're going, to, we're going to restrict the sum to one possible degree of g at a time. So we're going to attack this sum for each value of degree g once. And then you know, we can put this factor in front. And then we're going to sum those up to get our, our total estimate. And the reason that's a very good idea is because we need to apply different techniques for different values of n. So when the degree g is small, we'll be using a different strategy than when the degree g is large. So for small m, for very small values of g, this is the most classical range. Uh, and and th this has been, we're, we're using sort of nothing new that you can, you can open the sum, you can sort of look at the residue classes of f modulo g. And by doing that, you can transform this sum into some kind of Euler product. And, the, and you end up with exactly this constant CH or like CH times X over, over or times Q to the D over D. So the, the small M range, if you add it up, it gives exactly like the main term that we expect to be the limit. And so what that tells us is that we need to prove that the large M range, every other range, the sum cancels, it goes to zero so that the, large, the small M will dominate. Um, and then for very large M, uh, in particular, you can think about M almost twice the degree of F. So degree G is very large and F squared plus D over G is very small. We can transform the sum, manipulate a little bit to get a sum of Mobius of a, a polynomial. Um, so uh, of a polynomial and another variable. And when we do that, that's exactly the kind of sum we bounded in theorem three in our Chalice state. So once we transform the sum into a sum of Mobius and other variable, we're going to plug in our estimates from that sum. And the actual estimates that we proved were significantly stronger than what I stated in theorem three, but I didn't write them because it was like a more complicated statement. But basically we're not just showing the sum is going to zero, we're showing it's going to zero quite fast with like a power of savings. And there's also uniformity in the quadratic polynomial. And so using those two facts, we get cancellation, not just in the sum of a single quadratic polynomial, but also if we sum like over, over a bunch of quadratic polynomials, which we end up needing to do because of how we're manipulating the sum. And so using a sufficiently strong version of Chalice conjecture, we are able to handle the large M range. But there's a problem. The problem is, there's like a range of medium M that we can't handle using either methods. So either M that are greater than D, greater than the degree of F, but less than like one plus epsilon times the degree of F for like a small constant epsilon. Um, and for this range, we need like a completely different idea. And so this idea is a trick that's due to Hooley, which is to use um, kind of classical results in the theory of quadratic forms. So the kind of result that you want to use is like a number. So in the integer setting, the kind of result is a number is, is divides n squared plus one for some integer n, if and only if the number is a sum of two square. Uh, and so in general, we can show our, our polynomials that represent our divide f squared plus d, if and only if they are represented by certain quadratic forms of discriminant d. And so we'll use that, or you know, minus discriminant minus d over four. So we'll use that to re-express this as a problem about Mobius sums over quadratic forms. And then we will take one of the variables in quadratic forms 
and then uh, apply fear and threat. Um, okay, and so this is the basic strategy. We, we need to prove you know, a strong version of Chawla and we need some additional arguments, but we do eventually get our, our twin prime statement or, 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 or sorry, our, our quadratic Feynman-Horm statement in degree two. If you wanna know about twin primes, the argument here is basically the same, but a little bit different. We have two different primes. So we would sum two different von Mangel functions. So we'd have two different divisors degree here, divisors G here, and they would have two different degrees. And so instead, instead of having three ranges, we would have like more ranges because each divisor could have small degree, large degree, or medium degree. And it's the range where both divisors are medium. that are the trickiest ones for us. Uh, and in that case, we use some classical analytic number theory arguments uh, by uh, Fouvry and Michel to, to handle the final range. So we've kind of reduced the problem to a sum just of Mobius. And uh, let, let me explain something about how this goes. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Mobius sum, G, if we plug in R plus S to the P, that's a polynomial only S to the P. So Conrad, Conrad, and Gross shows it's a periodic function of S to some explicitly computable modulus S. And so we wanna, it's not an arbitrary periodic function. We wanna describe it as a kind of function that's meaningful in number theory. So the what, what kind of periodic function turns out to be is that we have a quadratic character to modulus M and we compose that quadratic character with a polynomial W in, in S with coefficients you know, that are polynomials mod M. So you plug S into some kind of polynomial and then you uh, evaluate co. So over the integers, this kind of function composing a character with a polynomial shows up all the time uh, in number theory. And this is showing up, but sort of in a completely different way. So the basic strategy you're going to use. So I'm going to explain a little bit of how to prove that kind of identity. And then the first thing I'm going to say, what's the basic strategy we're going to use once we have the identity? The basic strategy is we're going to write f as r plus s to the p. We can choose a nice set of r so that each f occurs once as r plus s to the p. And so we get a sum over r, sum over s, mobius of g of t of r plus s to the p. We, get, we then get a sum over r, sum over s of a quadratic character of a polynomial in s. And so then the remaining thing, once we prove its identity, is to get cancellation in these sums, quadratic character of a polynomial in S. So let me say where this identity is coming from. And then for simplicity, I want to only consider the case where our starting polynomial is G. So we'll only be looking at the Mobius of R plus S to the P. Um, and then to start this analysis, um, I'm going to, uh, you know, give this formula for Mobius that works for any polynomial, not just R plus S to the P. Uh, and the tool we'll use is going to be the quadra a quadratic character of FQ. So the multiplicative group of units of FQ is cyclic. There's a unique character that goes to the plus or minus one that's non-trivial. And if F has degree D, there's a formula of Pelé, which says the Mobius of F is equal to the quadratic character of the discriminant of the polynomial f up to this factor minus one to the d. And I'm sort of gonna ignore factors depending only on the degree in this analysis because we can just ignore them in the proof basically. And so this formula, you can prove it using Galois theory. You can relate Mobius to the action of Frobenius on the roots, which is like a permutation and it's related to the sign of the permutation. And the sign of elements of the Galois group acting on the roots is related to the discriminant. And that's how you prove Pelé's formula. And after you have that formula, we're, we're going to have just kind of very classical identities, algebraic identities in relating to discriminants of polynomials to like derivatives of polynomials and resultants of polynomials and all these other kind of very classical things. So the first identity is that the discriminant of F is the resultant of the derivative of f with f. So the resultant of two polynomials is a product of the values of one polynomial and the roots of the other. And if you, if you just write down, factor out, and write the values of the derivative of the roots of f, and you multiply them, you'll get the discriminant up to some sign that, 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 I, that I don't care about. Um, and so if you plug in r plus s to the p into this formula, well, we get a minus one to the d, 
times the quadratic character of the derivative of r plus s to the p with r plus s to the p. And so the, the key thing that makes everything work is we differentiate r plus s to the p. We use the product rule. We get p times s to the p minus 1. But p is 0 in our finite field fq. So we just get dr dt here and r plus s to the p. And then we use here this lovely symmetry property of resultants. Uh, so that the, the, the product of values of one polynomial are the roots of the other is the same thing up to some boring sign with the product of the, the values of the second polynomial at the roots of the first. So we're taking the product of the values of r plus s to the p at the roots of dr dt. And that is, um, dr dt is fixed. And so that only depends on s modulo dr dt. And it's like a multiple duplicative function in r plus s to the p. If you multiply two polynomials, you multiply their values at each root. So, so chi 2 of the resultant of a polynomial with dr dt is always a quadratic character of polynomial with modulo dr dt. And that gives us a formula of the form I've written uh, on top of the screen. And so for the general case, you need to do this argument. And then plus, you need to do a little bit more uh, work. You kind of use some elementary algebraic geometry, use the fact that any two polynomials, which have the same roots and the same order of vanishing of the roots, agree up to a constant. Because you, you write both sides of the entity as polynomials and you check they have, they have the same vanishing. So the last thing is we need to, we need to bound this sum. So one thing we could try to do to bound the sum is to take an analogy back to classical number theory and say I have a quadratic character, I impose of the polynomial, I'm summing it over S, and then this summing over S of degree small, it behaves like a small interval. It behaves like I'm summing over small natural numbers. And you could say there's all kinds of methods like the Burgess bound polyvinograd method for getting bounds for these sums over short intervals. Of, of character sums. And the problem is our interval is too short for any of those methods to be profitably applied. So we actually can't do that, except specifically if p equals three, you can get a little bit of juice out of this. So what we're going to do instead of applying these classical sort of more or less elementary methods in number theory is we're going to apply some, some very non-elementary approaches to bounding character sums. So we're going to think of this as a sum, not a short interval sum, for polynomials in a finite field, but as a complete sum for many different variables in finite fields. So you want to think of each coefficient of s as its own variable, which lies in a finite field, and we have a many variable sum over the finite field of some kind of character sum. And then Deline proves a very general bound for character sums using like these Itaú cohomology methods as part of his proof of the Riemann hypothesis over finite fields. And so we have to use Deleen's machine to, to make our result work. And he is a very powerful result, but he doesn't uh, give it to you for free. So to use Deleen's results to get a sufficient bound for the sum, you have to estimate some kinds of cohomology groups. Um, and it turns out the cohomology groups that appear uh, involve some kind of nice geometry. What you end up seeing when you analyze this sum is there's an arrangement of a bunch of hyperplanes in this high dimensional space. And you're interested in the complement of this hyperplane arrangement, the complement of the union of the hyperplanes. And you want to calculate the cohomology of that complement, not just uh, the ordinary cohomology, but twisted by some kind of quadratic local system, some quadratic representation of the, of, the, of the financial group. And the key thing we want to show is some kind of cohomology vanishing theorem. Um, but this is actually something that was similarly studied in characteristic zero by Cohen, D Dimka, and Orlick. They studied a very similar problem. And so we can adapt these kinds of character zero methods to a finite field setting and to show our cohomology vanishing result, which then uh, gives us, by applying this very huge machinery of Deline, gives us a very strong bound for this character sum, which we then sum over R to obtain our bound for Chalice conjecture, which 
is then strong enough to, to imply all the other results. Thank you for inviting me to speak.